Hi there. To all of our Facebook fans, we will be starting our official program in about two minutes. So you can join us and relax. We'll be moving on in a couple of seconds. How was everybody's weekend? It was good. It was good. We mm. celebrated my dad's 83rd birthday. Oh my oh, goodness. Great. That's amazing. 83. Amazing. 83. Wow. You guys Very proud. Up. Yeah. It was great. We had ridiculous amount of food. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> did you guys do all the social distancing and everything? We did. We were sanitizing and we were keeping our distancing. And it was hard, though. You want a hug. At the very end, we, we masked up and hand sanitizing. Tried to get a little bit in there. <laughs> it's kind of weird having celebrations and things um, doing COVID-19. So. We want to keep him safe, so... Absolutely. Well, it is 10 a.m. I want to welcome everybody to, let me just make sure all of our recordings are on. So I'm going to say good morning again and welcome back. Um, I'm Viara Small. I'm the founder and CEO for the Veteran Women's Enterprise Center. It's a national initiative that we've launched to help veteran women entrepreneurs scale for success. If you want to know more about our organization, visit us on our website at VeteranWomenSEC.org. That's VeteranWomenSEC.org. Now, for those of you who have been following us, you know that we were off in July staging for the rest of the summer. And I have to tell you, we have a massive program planned for you for the summer. Now, if you're not connected already, make sure you go to our website, sign up for our newsletter, which will be coming out tomorrow with all of the details. But I'm just going to give you a high level overview of what's happening for the rest of the summer. First, Monday morning message is back. You're going to be in for an exciting conversation this morning. And mark your calendar for next week because we will have our very own Mr. Austin. Our SBA DFW district manager will be with us. Also, Trending Thursdays is returning, but with a turn. Instead of doing a number of different programs this month and September, we will be running a training series. And this month's training series is focused on the business of service. And we're gonna kick off talking about how you can create lifelong customers. So make sure you mark your calendar to get on board with us for Trending Thursdays. That's every Thursday, 6.30 to 7.30. Also, we were very fortunate to be able to garner some COVID-19 funding. And so we have a couple of COVID-19 programs that are designed specifically for you. We want to make sure that you can get connected. So we have our next level business transformation that is jumping off this summer. Applications are on our website. Individuals who are selected for that program will get 25 hours of technical assistance plus a $5,000 grant. We need to make sure that you complete the entire application and upload all the necessary documents. That program will launch the week of August 17th and run into mid-September. Also related to COVID-19 is our Life by Design. It's our health, wellness, and personal development coaching program. It is a four-week power pack session. It's not a restart, but it's a rethink. Where are you and where do you want to be now and beyond COVID-19? This program is normally $200 per person, but thanks to the funding for COVID-19, we're able to get you a tremendously reduced scholarship. So if you're interested in joining that program, make sure you sign up because space is limited. Now, since our newsletter is coming out tomorrow, I am not going to take up any more time talking about all the great things that are happening. You need to get connected, sign up for the newsletter, and make sure you take some time to go through it and find out about all the awesome things that are going on. In the meantime, let's get to our program for today. Monday morning message. It used to be our COVID-19 political update because everything was coming out of DC. But now we're finding that a lot of the impact is happening locally or even nationally, but not just out of our political offices. It's happening by those of us who are working in the industry. 
And I think it's really important to start looking at the value of research. A lot of us have been overwhelmed with invites to do surveys and business and products and services. So why, why should you do these surveys? Why is this important? We're gonna talk a little bit about that today. So I wanna introduce the two ladies that are with me. Um, we're gonna get a gallery view going here so we can see everybody. Good morning, Corey. Good morning, Anna, how are you? Good morning. Doing well. Good. Good. So Good. I don't think anybody can introduce, them, can introduce themselves better than themselves. So I'm gonna let you ladies Tell everybody a little bit about you and the work you're doing, and then we're going to get into our conversation. So, Corey, why don't you go first? Wonderful. Yes, my name is Corey Harris. I'm the assistant director of the Hunt Institute, and the Hunt Institute is at Lyle School of Engineering at the Southern Methodist University. And I get the honor of working with collaborative interdisciplinary teams made up of undergrads, grad students, people like VR, professors, um, <laughs> uh, uh, any of our affiliates and our in-country partners. And we work specifically on projects that address the UN Sustainability Development Goals, Sustainable Development Goals. And um, yeah, I run the operations in here and it's fabulous. Great, great. Thank you, Cora. And uh, she's great to work with, just so I say. And mm -hmm. Anna, why don't you introduce yourself? Morning, my name is Anna Crockett. I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas and I actually work out of the Houston branch. Um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas is one of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks uh, around the country and our district includes all of Texas as well as parts of New Mexico and Louisiana. I serve on the community development team and our goal is to highlight issues that are most relevant to low income and moderate income communities in our district. And uh, as part of our work, we do a little bit of research as well as community outreach. And we kind of blend those two different roles. Uh, I tend to focus more on the research side of things, uh, which is why data is so important to my job. Um, and I'm excited to, to see where our conversation goes today. That, thank you so much. That's a great lead in because one of the things that we've been talking about, and I hear it all the time in my own circles is that people are kind of overwhelmed with this desire for to get information. Everyone wants you to take a survey. And I think people often ask, well, okay, what happens with that data? And how does that data impact me? Why should I take my time uh, to fill out a survey? So I, I know that the feds does a lot of surveys. You guys are constantly looking at what's going on. Talk to us about some of the value of an individual really looking at those surveys that come from, to you or from you to them and then what do we do with that information? How does that information impact us overall? So I'll start by saying um, what I'm saying today is a reflection of my personal professional views and doesn't represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas or the Federal Reserve System. Uh, now that I've got that disclaimer out there, um, data collection is super important to the work we do um, from the top down. Uh, as a lot of folks know, the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment. And those are both giant data questions, um, but it's important to look beyond the aggregate data as well. You know, as I mentioned, uh, my team focuses on low and moderate income communities and the aggregated data that you might see on unemployment or other issues may not reflect their economic experiences and their daily lives. So it's important to look uh, at the big data as well as more um, granular detailed data from specific communities, uh, which is why these surveys are so incredibly important. Um, there's no better way to serve the public, I think, than soliciting input from the members, uh, from the residents in our district on how the economy is working for them. Um, we know that the stock market is not how everybody judges how the economy is working for them. Uh, it may be how many customers they have, uh, how their neighborhood's doing, if they know a lot of folks who are working or not. There are a lot of different measures for the economy and it's important for us to pay attention to all of those metrics. And data is the is the one way that we can do that most effectively. And these surveys uh, that we do, including our Moments That Matter project that we wrapped up recently, um, are the best way for us to know how well the economy is working for everyone. Uh, we need that input in order to do our jobs as a public serving institution. That's awesome, Anna. And Cora, do you want to talk about, Corey, do you want to talk a little bit about what SMU is doing? You guys don't just look locally. You do a lot of uh, global research and, and national research. You know, what happens to that data? 
what happens to that information after it's all gathered? Well, I can't speak to all of SMU. I'm going to echo Anna's wonderful disclaimer. This is my personal views and not that of SMU or Lyle School of Engineering or necessarily the Hunt Institute. And um, bringing my circle in, I just wanted to speak to what Anna said real quickly before I answer your question, VR. I love how you worded that because speaking with the community level representatives is such a core value of the Hunt Institute. And so, you know, we have these interdisciplinary teams and we're getting together and we're maybe we're dissecting a specific issue and we're looking through what's being done, what's working, what's not working. And then we have to put the brakes on and we have to say, we need to talk to the community that's being affected by these issues. And it would be very short-sighted of us to think we could sit around our table and come up with our own innovative solutions. So, you know, taking that step back and pulling that data, and I can only speak to the data we pull here in the Institute, the data that we pull directly informs our projects and directly informs the solution set that we might be representing to the local community. And we like to have a feedback loop. Um, so maybe we will have a survey, maybe we will have um, something that's more formal, but then we typically wanna go back to the community and say, okay, this is what we heard you saying. This is what we think is the solution set. And now let's have another feedback cycle. And that's kind of what we're doing with the moments that matter phase two with the Hunt Institute is taking a deeper dive in the data that um, the Federal Reserve is able to pull together. So I want to give a really great example. At least I think it's a great example. When we look at the data around women veteran um, owned businesses. And so we know when the census pulled that data together, it was a national data pulled from a lot of resources that didn't really engage anybody. It was pulled from the IRS. It was pulled from information that came from the Small Business Administration. It was pulled from state um, information that came in about revenues and things that was reported. But they didn't actually get to talk to people. It was just a lot of aggregated data that said, hey, here's a broad picture. So in the broad picture, 97% of women veterans across our nation are making less than $25,000 a year in their business. However, when you start to dig deeper, we need to understand, is that really the situation for Dallas? Is that the situation for New York? Is that the situation for Los Angeles? Or is that more a pocket when you take all of it together and you mix in the rural areas and some of the non-metropolitan cities, you're getting this, this low number that's stretched out but if you really start to dove into these particular cities, you will find out maybe these women are doing better. And what hurts with that data when we don't dig deeper is we make these broad assumptions. And so what are some of the assumptions, Anna, that maybe you guys seen in the feds that you, there, there's been these broad assumptions about economy, about employment, about whatever the area that you're working on, um, socially economic developed people, why those situations are happening that when you had the opportunity to dig deeper through research, you found that maybe some of those assumptions were not correct. Yeah, um, I think an you know, example that I alluded to earlier was um, using the stock market as a barometer for economic success. Um, I think for a lot of folks who uh, tend to work at academic or research institutions, that's something that we rely on uh, often and for good reason. It is a good barometer of success uh, of the economy, although there are many other metrics that we need to be paying attention to as well. Uh, we know that there are a lot of folks in the community who do not invest in the stock market or it's just not the way that they um, track their wealth or, or economic success. And so we want to also be paying attention to the metrics that they choose for themselves. Um, and in doing part of this research project, I got to speak to a lot of um, entrepreneurs who don't really use the stock market or those big aggregate numbers as um, the sign of a healthy economy. You know, as I mentioned, for them, it's the number of customers they have. Um, if they've got people coming in their store, if they have a store, um, whether or not their neighbors have jobs and go, can go to work every day, um, especially in the pandemic, you know, this is what's top of mind for a lot of folks. Um, so. It's important that we look outside of the big aggregate kind of macroeconomic figures and um, learn what the everyday economic experience is of folks who live in our district, because for a lot of them, 
um, a, a chart on the stock market, how well it's doing is not is not their uh, figure of success. Exactly. And Corey, do you have a situation that you'd like to share where maybe there were some broader assumptions made around a research topic and when you had the opportunity to dig deeper, you saw that when you look at a micro level, even at a local area, that that's not really the assumption across the board. Sure. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that we actively, um, well, I, would, I don't want to say work against, but we certainly put it in, um, in front of us in our plan. And when new students come in and they're being trained and to work with these research teams, to work with these project teams, um, and, and under the supervision of faculty, we are always putting out in front of them, you have to understand the difference between the macro and the micro. And you have to understand that even if you look at the DFW situation, that might not be reflective of, say, South Dallas or West Dallas or North Dallas. And you have to get into the community. In fact, if the executive director here, Dr. Chalky, if she were here, she would say, we do a bottom up approach. And so we're constantly putting that out in front of us. And she's had many personal experiences, as have I in the past, where when you pull a specific amount of information, you think you have the solution, um, it, it's typically, you get blindsided. And I'll give you a very vivid um, experience in my personal life when I ran an orphanage in Nicaragua. Um, we had a fabulous donor who wanted to give beans to the orphanage. And it, it ended up being um, a problem because they wanted to ship the beans in versus buying them locally. And so I know this is a kind of a simple analogy, but it was a really big issue to the community because they wanted to eat the specific beans that they were used to, a black bean versus a pinto bean that was being shipped in from Texas. And the conversation went that the local people, this is not a solution to their hunger. This is not a solution to their issue. And it seems minor, but that's a very, very community level kind of conversation. And when you're talking about implementing solutions, when you're talking about implementing what we've all sat around the table and discussed and researched and pulled data and mapped things out um, and did our decision trees and so forth, then you turn around and you walk over to them and say, hey, we're gonna ship a whole container of pinto beans to you guys. Isn't that great? You're not gonna be hungry for a year. And they're all like, we hate pinto beans. We want black beans. So it's, it's, it's a so important. I know that's probably a silly analogy, but it was not silly to them. Um, and when those pinto beans arrived, it was not a pretty sight. Um, and we had to work through it. And that was a lesson that I will never forget. And so here in the Institute, all of our projects, um, whether they're research data or building something down in the Denison gym or down in the dig, um, we start with we talk to the community first. That's awesome, um, Corey, because one of the things I remember reading, and I, I was actually watching a, um, I think it was more of a, a documentary or information on some survey uh, research they had actually done. And they were talking about how there was a limited number of minorities, women, you know, socially, um, economically challenged individuals involved. And so, when they're doing research and everybody's not represented, then that means the research doesn't represent everybody. And so when we're coming up with these solutions, we're coming up with solutions that really reflect the people that we engaged. And if we don't dig deeper to reach everyone, then we're not coming up with solutions that cut across the, um, the broad spectrum of people that we wanna talk to. And I thought this was so important because I know women, we're, we are super busy. Super, super busy. I mean, I know men are busy too, but women are kind of like the super women, super woman kind of thing. And we have the home and the kids and all of these things that we're doing. And you have to make some really conscious decisions about where you're going to spend your time. I know with our survey, the Moments That Matter survey, that survey take a good 15, 20 minutes. So why do I want to take 15, 20 minutes out of my time to give you this kind of information? How is it going to impact me? Can either one of you talk about a project that you worked on where you saw some type of policy impact or some, some type of funding impact that came out of that research that made a difference? Because I think sometimes people think 
I'm going to fill this out and then they're going to put me in for an Amazon gift card that I'm never going to get because a thousand people are filling this out. But what's the real impact? Because it's way beyond the Amazon gift card. It's more about how your voice is being added to this conversation. Um, and what, um, does anybody want to go first? Or you want to go for Anna, you want to go first? I'm happy to. Yeah, I think um, it's so important what you said, I think, especially as we look at women entrepreneurs, um, the data, the facts show that uh, the experience for female entrepreneurs is inherently different than their male counterparts um, for whatever reason, for many reasons. Uh, and as we look at veteran entrepreneurs, especially um, if we use only aggregate data, like I was mentioning before, just uh, as the natural figures come out, it mostly represents male entrepreneurs. Um, but we, we know that, again, women face regular difficulties, uh, challenges, and opportunities as female entrepreneurs. So it's important that we disaggregate that data. And um, data is also very important for measuring success uh, as we go about uh, implementing policies, not necessarily me, but um, other folks who are legislators, policymakers, other stakeholders in the community. We want to know if their data, if, if their policies that they're implementing are successful or not. And data is a great way to measure that. And um, surveys typically tell us what, how well are we doing? You know, we think that this program's working well. Do you agree um, as a direct benefit uh, beneficiary of this policy? So um, I think that it's important to rely on community input to know if this targeted policy that we design for a particular community or a particular type of entrepreneur, is it working for you? Is it really doing what we think it's supposed to? Um, and without that feedback, uh, uh, as Corey said, we're just creating policies in our little boardrooms and sending them out and hoping that they work. So uh, I think having that feedback loop is super important. Uh, Corey? Yeah, um, and then when you add this to the global scale, um, you know, we're so blessed here in the United States. We, we have a lot of freedom and liberty and we have programs that are specifically designed like VR um, Enterprise to to focus on hearing the voice of women entrepreneurs. And um, when, you, when you talk to other implementation companies who are working globally, it's very difficult in specific areas to get that feedback from women. You typically have to have a woman go in person, be accepted into the community, and then try to get the feedback from them. So, you know, I think if people haven't left the United States and they haven't seen the way a lot of the world functions, uh, for me personally, if, if I get a survey that has something to do with the type of policy that are going to directly affect me, I am proud to fill that out because I feel like I have a chance, I have a voice to inform the policy that's going to directly affect me. And, you know, I feel very strongly about voting. I feel very proud to stand in line and cast my vote. And I think about the women that have come before us to give us that liberty and the men who have sacrificed to give us that. And so, you know, yeah, there are some data that's being pulled that's specifically for marketing or something. And, you know, do you like the blue or do you like the green? Okay, maybe I do or don't want to give my time to that. But if we're talking about policy, if we're talking about making decisions on where funding is going for women business owners who are veterans, if we're talking about um, specific things like that, um, it has incredible value. And, and the people that are on the receiving end of that, just the fact that they're doing this survey is, is a wonderful indicator that they truly do want to hear your voice and they do want to make these decisions based on that data as Anna has done such an excellent job of explaining that it's the rubber that meets the road. It's right where you live and what affects your business. And, you know, take that 15 minutes and fill it out and take the time to really, really have your voice heard so that these decision makers can represent you at that table. I wanted to add to what Anna just said. We, we just had this debate, I think it was the end of 2019. I was speaking to someone and and they were asking, oh, why are women bettering? Because veteran entrepreneurship is on the decline. And I had to correct them and say, well, no, veteran entrepreneurship is not on the decline because when you use the terminology veteran, you're predominantly referring to men and their entrepreneurship numbers are declining. 
but women veteran entrepreneur numbers are not declining. And that's why one of the reasons it's so important for women veterans to make sure that their voice is heard. Because if I didn't know that data and I only know it because I run a female veteran women entrepreneur, someone else would have heard that and said, oh, well, then I don't need to invest. I don't need to support a program that's declining. You know, maybe we need to look at why it's declining rather than pouring more money into it without knowing, you know, why is that happening? But in reality, women veteran numbers are still up and until we get some new data saying that it isn't, I mean, that's what we're standing on. And I think one of the other things I constantly say is that, okay, well, even if the numbers said we were declining, if we had this big surge over five years, wouldn't we wanna know what happened? Was it a lack of services? Was it a lack of money? Was it a lack of support? Did women just decide, hey, I was looking for a job. I couldn't find one. So I started a business, but now that I found a job, I'm out of it. Or is it that they just couldn't get what they needed to support it and they fell off? Don't we want to know the details? And the truth is, we don't get the details unless we engage the women. Because otherwise, we're just making a lot of assumptions. And I wanted you to just talk a little bit about our project, the project that we worked on, and some of the things that we got out of the Moments That Mattered um, research project. Sure. Um, so our Moments That Matter research project, phase one, was a survey that we did uh, for women veteran entrepreneurs in the DFW area. Um, it was a online survey, again, took about 15 minutes to complete, and we asked them a ton of questions about not just their demographic information, but also uh, their business, how they started it, how they're running it now, uh, their um, estimates on the future, how they think they're going to be doing next year. Uh, so we collected all of this information, had about 55 folks respond. Uh, which was great. And we ended up following up with the, with a few of them over the phone as well to ask follow-up questions. This was earlier this spring. And I want to say that um, those phone conversations are really illuminating. I had one folk person tell me, you know, I do a lot of surveys online. I, I always fill them out, but it's totally different just to have this one-on-one -on -one phone conversation. And I found that to be really true. Um, it's totally different to see, you know, 55% of respondents have a challenge with a bank, but you know, when you talk to that person one on one, you find out what exactly their experience was, and everyone has a unique experience. But um, those themes are so much more richer when you talk to folks, um, whether it's on the phone or in person. Hopefully, that we can do someday. Um, so we did the uh, survey as well as a few phone follow uh, follow up conversations, and then COVID happened, so <laughs> we had to take another step back and think. All right, well, we would be remiss to, to publish any of this information without checking in with folks and seeing how they're doing. So we did another follow-up survey uh, with just a few questions this time, just to check in with people, see how they're doing, uh, how their business is faring, what kind of resources they're using, and what they still need uh, that the resources haven't provided them. So this has been a, a long coming, um, but very rich and fulfilling process. And we finally have a report that we'll be publishing in the next week or two to share our findings. Um, and just to, to tease one, I think uh, lack of capital has been a big theme and I'm sure that's not gonna be surprising to a lot of folks listening to this, um, but it was certainly the loudest theme that, that I heard um, prior to the COVID conversation. And even since COVID, you know, if you don't have a lot of capital before COVID, after the pandemic hits, that's not gonna get suddenly better. It'll probably get worse. So that's a big theme that we've been looking at uh, as a result of our research project. I want to add to that, Anna. One of the reasons why we were able to get COVID-19 um, funding was because we were able to get our funders to understand that, hey, there are a lot of participants out here that missed the mark. They didn't get to the table for whatever reason. And so funding still needs to get to them. And even though the amount is small now, it's again, that research, that data that's going to say whether more money comes back in, what were you able to do? What did the businesses do with the money? How was that money used? Did it have an economic impact? Was someone able to hire people? Were they able to increase their revenues or expand their customer base? All of these things matter. And predominantly on the line here, we have women. And so it's so important to remind our women that our voice is often not heard. 
when research is done and a call is made, our voice is often not heard. And when your voice is not heard, decisions are made about us based on assumptions rather than on real data. So I cannot express to you enough, all of those surveys that were going on during COVID from the city, uh, from the SBA, from different um, major corporations, they were all trying to assess, what's my next move? Do I need to put money here? Do I need to put money there? You know, what's working, what's not working? And a failure on our behalf to fill out those surveys means when that data gets, gets crunched, women are not there. Women are not represented. So that can say one of two things. Either we're not doing business, um, this isn't important to us, which is absolutely not true, um, or we're just not at the table. And if we're not at the table, I can't develop something for you. I can't cook something for you to meet your needs. If I haven't had a conversation with you about what kind of flavors do you like? What's your favorite this? What should I put in it? Do you want it rare or medium? If I don't have that conversation, then I'm not really cooking it for you. I'm cooking it for the general population. I'm just hoping everybody will enjoy it. But if I'm going to design something for you, I've got to have a conversation. That's what research does. It gives you that chance to have that conversation. When we developed the Moments That Matter Research Project, we really didn't develop it in phases, but we realized it needed to be phases. And it didn't come from the sky. The National Women's Business Council has been recommended that more gender specific data be done in the veteran entrepreneurial community, as well as local, because you're getting all of this broad data from around the nation. And we know that New York's economy is different than Dallas' economy, is different than LA's economy, is different than Chicago's economy. So what do those differences look like? And what challenges are women facing across those broad spectrums? So it was really important for us to dig in and get that information. And that's one of the reasons why the survey was so long. And so one of the complaints that we had was around revenues. Okay, why do you need to know my revenues? So Anna, why, why is that revenue data important? It's incredibly important because um, we need to know if your businesses are faring as well as you want them to. Uh, if you say your goal is this figure, but you're 10 times below it, we want to know that um, because that tells us that there's a lack of resources and there's something that we could be doing better to help assist you and get you to your goal uh, and vice versa. If you're blowing it out of the water, um, that's important to know too. We want to know if uh, things are working well for you and if they're not what kind of policies we can design to help get you to where you want to be. And, and I don't want to do all the talking, but because I'm in this arena all the time, I had a woman say to me, oh, well, women, they don't build big businesses. And we had just had the conversation about capital. And I had to say to her, well, didn't we just have the conversation women can't access capital? So how do I build a manufacturing firm when I can't get a bank to back me to rent that building and, and buy that equipment? How do I build a trucking company when I can't get a bank to finance me to purchase the line of trucks that I need and get that money up front to pay my employees because no one's working for free to get that company off the ground? But women are innovative. So if we can't get what we want, we do what we can. So we find a business that we can launch and we start moving forward with that but then it ends up draining us. And one of the big things we've seen women do is they use their own money. And you would think that's great. You're investing in yourself. Yay. But then you overextend. And the bank doesn't look at it as an investment in you. They look at you as now a risk. So now you've invested all that money, which was a great thing with your business and you believe in it. But now when you get ready to go to that next level, you don't have those other people that believe in you that can help you be successful. And that's why getting those revenues is so important because we can see this woman made a $5,000 investment, this person made a $10,000 investment and their revenues are at X. So letting us know that if we begin to invest in these companies, if we can get capital to these companies, they can grow. But if we don't get capital into it, it takes money in most instances to make money. <laughs> Corey, why don't you talk to us a little bit about your experience with Moments That Matter so far. Yeah, so we're doing phase two, and uh, we started out the beginning of the spring semester, and we were getting this whole program uh, or project structured, and then COVID hits, and <laughs> 
all of our student workers then had to start working remotely. They had to start doing their classes remotely. And I just got to take a second and brag on them because we have some very resilient student workers and we worked through it. I mean, I had to work through it. We all had to work through it. We had to figure out how are 35 of us going to work um, on all of our different areas with Zoom and Slack and Trello and, and everything. And so we certainly hit some curveballs. Um, the biggest curveball is we weren't able to have in-person focus groups. Um, so we started going back to the drawing board and, and you know, kind of picked ourselves up off the ground and tried to get our bearings and started reframing it in the summer semester uh, on how to approach this. And it actually turned out to be a benefit because now we're able to access national focus groups because if the webinar like this is done, um, it doesn't matter where you are, as long as you have internet connection, you can get on line and you can do this focus group, which added a whole different layer, more bang for the buck. I mean, we were able to take the exact same project funding for this and say, okay, now we don't just have to focus here in the DFW area, we can go across um, you know, the entire United States and, and everywhere where veteran women are working. And um, so we're, we're excited about that. And then, then we hit the technical side of things, you know, how are we gonna structure this? How are we gonna structure that? How is he gonna make the participants feel? How long do we need to do this? And so we're fortunate here at the Institute to have a fantastic network of experts. And so we did some phone calls with various professors. Well, I should say Zoom calls with various professors and other people who handle marketing focus groups and you know how how can we approach doing this that's really going to be a benefit to the attendees and um and to pull this data to help inform centers and in, in enterprises like what vr is doing so we're excited we're going to start uh the end of this month with our first focus group um and that's going to be very exciting and i'll have to say on a personal note one of the things that i love the most about doing the projects here in the institute is watching the students transform. And um, I, am, I am anxious to see what it's gonna be like when the students are able to hear what the women business owners, these veterans who have served our country and who are now on the front lines of our economy, really. And um, they're working to, to rebuild or restructure or even launch. I don't know where they're gonna be. Um, and here, it, I, I'm, one of the things I love to do is sit back and listen to their conversations in amongst themselves and the questions that they start to ask each other and the paradigm shifts that happen. It's a real shot in the arm to see that. So I'm looking forward to when the team reassembles for our fall semester and we hit um, that focus group and, and get to listen to what they have to say. So it's going to be a journey. I'm very interested to see where this takes us. That's awesome. It's really been awesome working with SMU. They've been a great team. And as uh, Corey said, facing COVID has been a challenge, but we pivoted and repositioned this project and got everything lined up. And I think the, the greatest thing that we can share with our audience is that, again, this is an opportunity for your voice to be heard. And what we're going to be doing in this next level is really digging deeper. I mean, we make a lot of assumptions about what happens to women entrepreneurs, but are these things happening because you're a woman? Are they happening because you're in a minority group? Are they happening because you happen to be a veteran? Or are they happening just because you're in this industry of small business? And these are the challenges that entrepreneurs face. So we need to dig deeper because policymakers will say, well, and I heard this when we were first asking for money when COVID started. Oh, all businesses need money. Yes, all businesses do need money, but some businesses are gonna need money more than other businesses because as Anna said, some of our businesses were struggling before COVID-19. And with the onset of COVID-19, it was like having a brick, you know, fall on your house or a tree fall on your house. Your house needed repairs anyway, but now with the tree, we got a whole new level of repairs that we need now. And so it's different. It's different than just the house needed repairs. Now the house needs some urgent repairs. And the other thing is the focus group allows us to really have that conversation and talking to women across the nation, we'll get a chance to see all women in Dallas having the same issues as women in New York, 
or women in California, women in Virginia, women in Georgia or South Carolina? Are they, do they have separate programs or different programs that are making a difference that we need to be looking at in other areas? And we don't always get to have those conversations because we're all in our little small, you know, kind of networking groups. This is a chance to broaden that net and begin to hear what other people are doing that are challenges as well as successes. So we're really super excited about that. Anna, can you talk a little bit more about some of the things we found in our report? We don't want to get a whole report away because of course we want them to read it, we'll re-release it, but we do want to share a little bit about some of the things we found, particularly um, anything that we can relate to COVID right now. Because again, I want you ladies, it's mostly ladies on the line now to know there will be more surveys coming out because we're getting ready to do the next line of the CARES Act. And the question is, as you can hear all over the news, um, are they getting too much money? Is it money get, keeping people from going back to work? Are businesses really able to use this money to entice their employees to come back? What employees are coming back? What employees are not coming back? If you don't respond, then people are making assumptions or just whoever they spoke to, that's what they're leading with. Well, I spoke to a business, uh, remember, uh, a business that said this, and now their whole perspective is molded around that conversation. That's one business in one arena in one area. You gotta have a broader conversation. So make sure as these things are hitting your inbox that you're taking the time, particularly if it relates to your business or your industry, open it up and respond and make sure that your voice, your perspective is being included in that broader report that's coming out the saying, here's what's happening. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you hit it on the head. I think when it comes to, to COVID, you know, our, uh, our feedback was varied, um, although there were a lot of themes that kept popping up um, through our small sample size. Um, I saw that a lot of what surprised me was that a lot of business owners that we reached out to, they felt like although there was a lot of chatter about reaching out to small businesses, a lot of dollars flowing around, uh, they hadn't really felt the impact of the resources coming to them yet, um, which was disheartening to hear because again we knew how how vulnerable they were prior to COVID generally speaking uh, and how much they really did need some resources but um, when we reached out to them back in April we didn't see that they were in general receiving the resources that they needed um, and it did vary how uh, able folks were able to pivot um, you know we had a lot of folks who for example a financial coach Usually she did her classes in person. Well, we can move that to online and it's there's gonna be some tweaking that needs to be involved, but in general, that's a pretty easy pivot to make. Whereas someone who um, whose clientele is entirely other small businesses who does websites for them, you know, the small businesses that they work for, they're tightening their budgets. There are no in-person networking events to find new clients. And they were really, and it, between a rock and a hard place. Um, so it, it, it hit different folks differently, but um, in general, we didn't see that the resources that uh, were flowing from government or local um, business communities were really uh, hitting the folks that we were speaking to, which um, of course is, is um, an issue that we need to address going forward as we try to recover from this pandemic in the next few months. I think it's a, I saw a question in the chat room that says, um, this may totally be our subject, but are there resources to help obtain an LLC? And it's off subject, but on subject, because in the state of Texas, we had a house bill 1049. And in the last session, they were doing some revamping of the bill and it got hung up in committee. This is why your voice has to be heard. This is why you need to belong to different advocacy groups and chambers. And this is why you need to let these organizations know that you are a veteran. That program was very actively used by our veterans here in Texas. But someone in that committee thought it was okay. And that that particular bill was not a priority. It sat in committee and it sunset on December uh, 31st, 2019. So of course we're working now to get the language together and to be ready after the election to hit Austin and get back to these people and say, look, you need to get this bill back. This was something that was great for veteran entrepreneurs. And so this should have never been allowed to sunset. But this is what happens when we're not paying attention and we're letting other people make decisions for us. This is what happens. And someone in that committee felt like not enough veterans were using it 
So we didn't do a survey around 1049. Who did a survey around 1049 to say how many people are using it? How many veterans have actually taken advantage of that bill? I can tell you of at least 35, almost 50 that I referred personally. So I know veterans were utilizing this opportunity to get their LLC process and to waive those franchise taxes. But again, if that voice isn't getting to the right people, if that information is not getting to the right people, then they're making decisions based on whatever conversations they're having. And if that conversation doesn't include us, then they're making decisions that impact us negatively. So that's a really good question. And right now, no, there is no um, particular resources to help you pay for your LLC, but for um, Small Business Administration, of course, we can, all of these different organizations can help you fill out the paperwork. But if you're speaking to actually paying for the processing, that particular resource no longer exists in the state of Texas. But um, definitely be stay aware, stay connected, because we're going to be up in Austin making sure they get this out of committee and we get this back in effect. And we're hoping we can push them to grandfather. So people that had to go through this process in 2020 um, will either get a refund or get some kind of connection because they dropped the ball. We didn't. And um, that should have never happened. But that was a great question. And anyone else, it is 1044. So I want to make sure we're not just talking, talking, talking. I'm sure you joined because you had an interest. You wanted to know what was going on. So if you have any questions, now would be the time uh, to put your question into the chat box and let us know uh, what you're thinking. I'll talk a little bit more about the Moments That Matter project because I think it's really cool. I was reading, uh, I think it came out in May or June, uh, the VA. Their, their whole program for dealing with women veteran, they added a component, which they call the moments that matter, where they're really looking when they're doing their assessment now at the moments within that healthcare process that matter to women veteran. And I thought, wow, we are all on the same page. We are all thinking the same thing that we have to dig deeper. It just can't be the surface. Did you make the appointment? Did you get the appointment? No, it's deeper than that. Was the appointment really what I needed? Did I walk away with what I needed? Because it's not just the appointment, it's the outcomes of the appointment. It's the experience in the appointment. And that's the same thing that happens with us as entrepreneurs. It's not that I just get a mentor. Was that mentoring helpful? Mm -hmm. uh, did it answer my question? Did it help me get to the next level? Or did somebody just check a box? Can I just jump in here? Yes, you know, this, this is... What we at the Institute are hoping to focus on when we're facilitating these focus groups with VR is the why. It's the big why. And I, I love, Anna, that you guys have um, followed up with phone calls and have been able to off script, you know, a little bit. Let, because sometimes in a survey, it's, you know, we've, been, we've been going over how, what questions are we going to ask and how are we going to phrase them and, and, you know, getting various faculty to, to screen them for us and help us make sure we're framing it correctly. But you can have the best framed question in the world, but if you don't step back and have some sort of space that's allowed for people to say, okay, but why? And, and, and that's where you really pull back that layer and you get to see down deep into that local issue. And um, you know, with these focus groups that we have coming up and we are going to be releasing that registration, you know, here in the next few weeks um, is, is the whole theme is going to be, okay, but why? Let it tell us why and, and really, really be transparent with, with the truth of what you're dealing with and what you need and how you think, I mean, if you were sitting in VR's chair, what would you do? How, how would you help shape this policy if you were in Anna's chair? You know, really giving people that opportunity to have that voice. And we talk about having voice. We talk about that, and it's a it's a common phrase. But when you when you set yourself up to sit at the table, you know that's what these focus groups are. You you have a seat at the table, and and we're recording it, and we're doing a deep dive into it, and we're going to dissect it, and and. I, it just, 
it's it's you needed this you needed the survey you most certainly needed the survey for that foundational but then just like what Anna did that follow up call where you're able to just one on one ask those questions and then there's another layer that happens in the focus group because now you're hearing what another business owner veteran woman is dealing with maybe she is in New York or California or North Carolina or Florida and maybe it's going to be encouraging to go oh we're the same. We're both dealing with the same issue. Or maybe she figured it out, you know, where she is, and I can pick up something and learn from that and apply it where I am. So, you know, having that mix of people who are having that conversation together, um, that even takes it to a whole nother level. So I am just encouraging any veteran women who are business owners who are listening today to be watching for these um these invitations to come out if you don't get it if you don't get the email man reach out directly on facebook or to vr herself or to the hunt institute uh, we want to hear from you we want to make sure that you were invited to it um you know sometimes in our list of reasons why people are not answering surveys maybe you never got the email so please don't let that be a problem please let you know let us know so we can make sure and include you I think that's so important because I want to just let uh, the attendees that are here and anyone that happens to be listening on Facebook know space is limited because you want to have a small focus group. You want everybody to have time to talk and share their experience. So, And it's also going to be very time sensitive, unlike the survey. I think we kept the survey open for about six to nine months, Anna, but the focus group is only going to run over the summer and then we're going to be done and then we're going to start analyzing that information. And I think the big step with any research is what do you do with it? So for us, we're not just trying to gather information for the fun of gathering information. Ultimately, we want to create a platform, a tool that we can open up across the nation where women veteran can go and report what they're experiencing. And then anyone in your area can go to that platform, you know, plug in Texas and say, okay, what industry are women veteran in in Texas? What kind of revenues are they producing? What kind of contracts are they getting? Um, how many employees do they have? And whether it's a funder or a policymaker, they can no longer say, I didn't know. They can no longer say, we don't have that information, so we'll just have to hold off on that because the information is readily available to anybody that wants to obtain it, that really wants to support women veteran entrepreneurs. And I'll let you know, there are a lot of annual reports that come out on entrepreneurship or women in general, but there is nothing that pulls out women veteran entrepreneurs and lets policymakers and funders and stakeholders know what's going on. And this is even a good tool for you because if you want to know, hey, where's another woman, woman veteran that's doing what I'm doing? I want to do a contract, but I can't do it by myself. I want to team up. You know, who else is doing what I'm doing in my industry if you're looking for competitors? You know, who's, who's making those revenues? Is this a good industry for me to go in? You can use it as a research tool. Are women making money in this industry? Are they getting funding in this industry? And that's something else we're going to start to look at because a lot of the banks say, oh yeah, we support small businesses, but we're going to start looking at who's applying to what banks and what kind of, what size loans are you getting from these banks and being able to acknowledge if you're looking for something below 50,000, these are the banks that are predominantly giving out these loans. If you're looking into the millions and the six digits, these are the banks that have a pattern of giving out those kind of loans. So you don't waste your credit and you don't waste your time going to a bank that just doesn't have a history of supporting loans at that level or even in that industry. Let's go where the history is. And I think Cheryl made a really good comment that companies are asking for surveys and they pay for it. But I want women to understand that they won't always pay for your opinion. But if you don't give it, then you're not at the table. So we do have a great incentive. We have an incentive packet for our focus group, but don't wait for an incentive to do a survey, particularly around business and also now around economy and your home with real estate and housing and education. These are key issues that people are going to make decisions about that are going to directly impact your life, your livelihood, and your family. That's not something you need a gift card for. That's something you want to run and take and make sure that your voice is being heard because the decisions are going to be made. 
Whether you're included in it or not is your decision. But the decision is going to be made. And right now, decisions are being data-driven. People are looking for data. Where's the data that supports I should put a million into this? Where's the data that supports we should put more money into this industry or that this industry is booming? Data it's driving all of this. And, it, and that data is being collected from individuals through surveys and through research. So the value is just ridiculous. I want you guys to know the SBA every year so far, um, they've done about a $300,000 grant for women that are entrepreneur training. Well, remember this last survey that came out from the citizens, we grew from 4% to 15.2%. That was almost 400,000 new businesses. So that grant is less than a dollar per business that we know of. So if we want more investment, we got to make sure that these organizations know that we exist, that we're making an economic impact, and then here's the need. And so your voice, if you want it heard, this is one of the ways you're going to get your voice out here. We're not the only ones, um, but we're the only ones focused on women, veteran entrepreneurs exclusively. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm, I'm not going to say that what we're doing is more or less important. I'm going to say that you really want to hear, have your voice heard and that research is a valuable way of that happening. And that if you have the opportunity to participate, take it very seriously. Because oftentimes our voice as a woman, as a minority, and even as a veteran, oftentimes our voice is not heard. And it's not heard because we're not at the table. And sometimes it's not because we're not invited. It's because we don't accept the invitation. Um, Anna, it is about 10.55. I want to see if Oh, I'm sorry, I muted myself. And I want to see if you have any closing comments, anything else about the report that's coming out, um, anything else about the value of research that we can impart to our listening parties. We just um, updated five new audio platforms. So every week these sessions will get added to our audio platform. So if you missed us today, you can always go back and catch this information, listen over dinner while you're cleaning, doing laundry, but get connected. Yes, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking of an example from our findings in the report on how um, overwhelmingly our respondents did not have a loan with a, a business loan with a bank. Um, and it's important for us to have that information and also, as Corey was saying, find out the why. I think it's easy for outside observers to maybe see most of these businesses don't have a business loan from a bank. Well, maybe they should, you know, why wouldn't they do that? It's a lot of, it's easy for people to make assumptions. And when they read reports and findings that we did, that we did, that say, here's why I didn't do it. Here's all of the discouraging things that have happened to me throughout my business career. Here's why I wasn't able to do it. Here's where my credit was, what happened to me before. There are very good reasons why people make the decisions they do. And I think it's easy for folks to uh, to make assumptions and then as a result, perhaps people get excluded from policies that are made um, intentionally or unintentionally. But having that bridge and that um, empathy bridge is really important to, to getting everyone the, the services that they deserve. Um, in closing, I would just say that um, from our point of view, we want to create an inclusive economy for everybody, for everyone to participate in fully. And this Moments That Matter project is exactly um, us putting the rubber to the road again, as Corey said earlier. Um, we need to hear from folks how we're doing, how we can do better, what we can do for you. Um, so again, without, without hearing from community members, their input, um, we're only making our best guess. Um, and, and oftentimes that best guess is not good enough. So we need everybody's participation. Thank you, Anna. Cora, Corey? Yes, um, thank you again for having me on this show and I, or this, <laughs> this webinar. Um, and we are very excited about phase two. Um, there's, there's certainly some big shoes to fill with the baton being handed off from the Federal Reserve. And we are excited to um, connect with you guys on that. And I would just encourage once again, anyone who's watching this right now who is a veteran woman and you're a business owner and you've been in business for a year, maybe even two years or plus, um, it would be just invaluable 
to this project, to this research, um, and to inform this online platform, this tool that we're going to be creating. And thank you, VR, for talking about the, <laughs> what's the deliverable? Hello, yes. The deliverable is going to be a platform online that you can interact with and funders can interact with. And, you know, I didn't serve in the military, but I have the highest highest regard for our veterans. And knowing that we have a specific service set aside just for veteran women who are business owners is just such a specialized differentiator for the enterprise and what they're specifically trying to do. And the fact that the Federal Reserve has connected with this enterprise to, to hear your voice and take such a deep dive into this specific category, is very encouraging. I hope it's encouraging to you as well. So please take a moment to consider being a part of this focus group. Like VR said, obviously space is limited and we're only going to do so many sessions. So be watching in your email and watching for this uh, communication on social media. And we sure hope that you will come to the table and let us hear your voice. Thank you, ladies, both of you. And I want to just make one more point to the audience um, that came out of our survey that I thought it was so surprising to me. And that we asked the women about veteran specific programs that they had engaged or that they even knew about. And so many of the women, so many of the 55 had not engaged a veteran specific entrepreneur program, nor did they know about a veteran specific entrepreneur program. So we're going to ask you, please spread the word. Let people know there is a veteran women enterprise center. There are programs specifically designed to support veteran entrepreneurs because if we don't engage the population, if the population is not effectively engaged in service, you're going to lose these programs. And then you're going to just fall into the vast mist of, oh, well, we're all entrepreneurs, but our needs are different. And if you want those needs met, you have to be connected. So I am so respectful of everyone's time. It is 11 a.m. I want to thank Corey and Anna for an amazing conversation. Remember that this is being... Uh, also stream live on Facebook and will be added up, added to our other audio platforms within a week. So thank you so much for joining us on the Monday morning message. And we hope to see you next week. Same place, same time. Thank, thank you. you thank you. Thank yeah. you, ladies.